Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session on recovery. I'm Caroline Julian, Director of Policy at the Creative Industries Federation, and I'm joined by three leaders from across the creative and cultural industries to discuss next steps as our sector looks to recover. So what are the priorities during the recovery phase and how different or not should the sector look like compared to before? So introducing Tarek, Jamie and Neil. Tarek Iskander is the Artistic Director and Chief Executive of London's Battersea Arts Centre, a theatre director and playwright. Tarek previously served as Interim Director for Theatre of Arts Council England and was also Artistic Director of Up Next. He was one of the founders and associate artistic directors of the Yard Theatre in Hackney and also resident director at the National Theatre Studio. And to give his perspective on the state of play for music, we have UK Music's new chief executive, Jamie Nyoku Goodwin. Before this, Jamie was one of the government's most senior advisors, serving as special advisor to Health Secretary Matt Hancock and previously in the same role at the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. And finally, introducing Neil Peplow, who is Director of International Affairs at the British Film Institute. As a producer, Neil was involved in the production of 18 feature films and TV series. Whilst Director of Film at Creative Skillset, he was responsible for the UK's film skills strategy. He was CEO of the Australian National Film and Broadcast School from 2015 to 2019 and established the Screen Diversity and Inclusion Network that brought together broadcasters and funders to address inequality in the Australian screen sector. So um, a wealth of experience and expertise um, across our panellists this morning and into early this afternoon. Um, I'd like to turn first of all to Tarek, um, if I may. So Tarek, what is the reality for the Battersea Arts Centre right now? How has your organisation organization responded to the pandemic and what's been possible for you this year? So, I mean, clearly for us, like for every cultural organization in the country, it's been a really, really difficult year. And um, the euphemisms say that all our operations have been disrupted and particularly our ability to put on live performance in a meaningful way has been extremely difficult. But saying that, though, what we, we have actually been able to shift our activities fairly quickly to do the things that we really care about. So moved a lot of our work and commissioning of artistic practice online. We've been running a lot of the sessions with local young people that we used to run with our Beatbox Academy and entrepreneurial projects like programs have still continued to run online and occasionally in a socially distanced way in this period. And, you know, equally, we've managed to run a lot of the national programs that we're kind of involved with, like co-creating change and so on. So I'd say it's been hugely disruptive, clearly financially very challenging. But actually, I think like other organizations have shown our ability to shift in order to fulfill our core purpose in a very different way. And obviously we're, we're all, everyone's in the same boat. And so kind of working with partners and other colleagues, everyone's really pulled together to make that happen. So I think that spirit of mutual support has really made all the difference. That's really good to hear. Thanks, Tarek. And are you looking to gradually reopen in any way um, over the next few weeks and months? And, and how are you looking to kind of reopen and recover um, as we as we head toward the spring and summer next year? Well, in terms of live performance, we actually ran some live performances through this period. We have an outdoor courtyard space within our building. So we were able to welcome audiences in a COVID secure way through that. We had actually planned to open our grand hall and main spaces to socially distant performances just as the second lockdown hit. So we've put that on hold till spring. But I guess broadly speaking, our plan is to continue our digital work, bring back socially distance audiences into spring and summer, and then hopefully larger audiences later in the year. But the only thing I'd say, Caroline, is I really disagree with the narrative of theatres reopening, um, as if they are not currently, as I'm saying, there's loads of activity happening up and down the country with companies and theatres and venues still doing loads of work. And I think getting too fixated on whether the doors are open to audiences maybe misses some of the points of those organisations. That's a really good point. Thank you so much, um, And then, Jamie, if I can turn to you um, next. So how has the pandemic impacted on the music industry in all of its forms, so recorded, live, digital? Um, and have you found that certain parts of it have suffered far more than others? Yeah, thank you, Caroline. And I think we've had a very similar experience to, to Tarek, actually. Um, but the thing we've learned most of all over the past 10, 11 months is really how interconnected the music industry and the music sector is as an ecosystem. So for example, uh, recording studios, and particularly over the last couple of months, recording studios have been able to continue. Uh, they continue through lockdown, but 
um, the live sector um, and live performance, um, a lot of it just hasn't really been happening. We've been trying to make things happen where we can, but the challenges we've often found is it's not just the limits on uh, things being able to happen, but what that does to the financial viability of live audiences. Um, so when you're having to do social distancing, um, in many places, one of the big impacts has been not being able to sell alcohol uh, in events. All this kind of contributes towards your business model and makes it very difficult to be putting on, uh, to be putting on events. And even though the live sector in the music industry has been particularly hard hit, that has had a knock on throughout the music industry. So as an industry, we're made up of publishers, we're made up of songwriters, we're made up of kind of recording studios, of live performance. But if you're a publisher or a songwriter, lots of what you're writing things for are going to be performed live. And if, if that bit of the sector isn't, work, isn't working or isn't operating, um, then you're finding yourself being impacted. The recording side of the sector, that's how you promote a lot of your acts. It's how you find a lot of your new acts and your new, uh, new talent. Um, and when grassroots music venues aren't really, be, uh, aren't really open for various reasons, when big live events aren't really happening as they haven't been over the past 10, 11 months, uh, it has a real impact across the ecosystem. So in many ways, actually, it's made the whole music industry realize how interconnected it really is and how dependent bits are on other bits. But as Tarek says, we've been trying our best to be, to be trying to get to make things happen, to be trying to do things. Lots of organizations have been doing socially distanced concerts, socially distanced gigs. But the reality has been it's been exceptionally difficult. Um, many just haven't really been able to make it work uh, viably um, financially. Um, and I think we're all looking forward to a point where we can recover, get back, uh, get back on our own two feet and start doing what we were um, this time last year. Thank you very much, Jamie. And, and the point you make about the wider ecosystem is, uh, is a really strong one. I think we're seeing that across the whole of the creative industries as well in terms of that knock on knock on effect. Um, and Neil, turning to you, so um, work in film and TV has been able to, um, I guess, restart sooner than other parts of the creative industries. What would you say helped make that happen and what barriers now remain? Uh, I think what was really important is we uh, set up a BFI-led uh, Screen Sector Task Force, which had 90 me uh, members from across the entire value chain. Um, and that split into, I think, five working groups, uh, one which was looking at production protocols. So what did we need to do to ensure that sets and productions were safe, COVID safe? Uh, another group which is looking at um, how to cover COVID liabilities if a production was impacted by having to shut down for a few weeks or a couple of weeks. Um, another tax relief group to look at additional costs of COVID which were associated with production. One which is looking specifically at distribution exhibition um, and another one which was looking at independent film. Uh, and I think having that strategic overview and then those very specific asks of government allowed us to move forward um, incredibly quickly and also the support of the DCMS and government to consider, for instance, getting the production protocols in place quickly gave confidence uh, to inward investors, so US studios, but also to the independent sector when the production restart scheme uh, happened. So the fact that each production is in effect itself a bubble has allowed us to kind of put more controls in place which have also allowed us to get actors and crew exempt from any travel quarantine um, restrictions that have been imposed so i just think it's um kind of an industry-wide approach from producers production ex executives um through to uh, executive um well dcms um uh, staff looking at it and thinking okay how can we adapt and innovate and put into place things quickly. So uh, I think that has allowed us to, to, to restart and continue to be open during lockdown and uh, get back to production levels at about 80% of, of what they were before. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. And in the return to kind of 100%, what's needed now? Is it really just a kind of easing up of the restrictions that are in place? Yeah, and I think kind of a return to, to, to being confident that um, productions will not have to constantly shut down um, and go, you know, parts of the crew having to go into quarantine for 14 days. So obviously uh, the, the biggest um, thing which will affect that is uh, mass testing and also uh, the introduction of a vaccine. Fantastic. Um, and uh, Tarek, you mentioned it earlier that already um, theatres and other performing arts venues and, um, uh, and live events have been able to reopen over the summer. Um, but when it's possible again to uh, attract larger groups of people, physical audiences, um, Jamie and Neil in particular, are you looking to launch any campaigns to drive audiences when that's possible to cinemas, to gigs, to festivals um, and other parts of your sectors? So yeah, it, it's a really key point, I think. I think we saw over the summer, 
Um, lots of people looking at how we got the hospitality industry up and running, how do we get bars and pubs and restaurants open? That happened. And then I'm sure we, I, mean, I remember it was completely eerie kind of walking through Soho and seeing all these kind of like places throwing their doors open, but no one really coming in because there was a big public confidence issue. Um, and so I think it's for us, it's not just looking at how we get back on our feet, but how we make sure that um, the kind of public confidence is there and the public feel safe um, at events. And it's why I think Neil put it really well, it's why testing and vaccines are so important and we always try and make clear to people we're not just trying to sort of re remove restrictions or sort of say we want to do stuff about social distancing just so we can sort of be get back up doing what we're doing previously we want to be engaged in testing we want the vaccine to be working and rolling out properly because it's really important that when we get back to a position to be operating without social distancing the public feels they're safe people know that there's kind of no risk and we we want to be doing everything we can as, as an industry and as a sector to be making sure people know that when they're going to live events whether that be kind of like music venues or theater or the cinema us as an industry have done everything we can and they are in a safe environment and they shouldn't feel like they need to feel any sort of risk at all because it is it is key that when we get back on the run i'm running um uh, we have people feeling feeling safe and confident to be coming to be coming back to cultural events Fantastic. And what's the case, Neil, for cinemas? And, and I know that you've been working with that particular kind of part of your sector um, in driving audiences both over the summer, but also looking at, at kind of spring as well and beyond. Yeah, it's, um, we, we, there was a campaign called Love Cinema that was uh, run by the uh, UK Cinema Association, which was, again, just saying we're open for business. And this is actually an incredibly safe place to go for entertainment because the protocols that are in place are incredibly rigorous. Um, and we're also working with uh, Biffa to bring another campaign which is going to be released to drive audiences back into um, going out on an evening to watch a film. Um, but we actually found that the biggest um, uptick in box office came with the release of Tenant. And I think actually it's going to be the campaigns which promote tempo releases like Wonder Woman this Christmas that will actually really push people back into the cinemas and get them to understand that it is a place which actually they can be comfortable um, being entertained in uh, in a group. So I think there's there's only so much those generic campaigns can do. It's, it's actually also getting the distributors back into being confident that they won't be affected by another uh, tier three lockdown and that they will have enough time to be able to you know, get, get the level of box office that they had got previous to um, the COVID, COVID outbreak. It's a really helpful. Just, so I was just going to add, just add a really, really quick one point on that, which is actually it's a lot of it is sort of waiting to see what the post pandemic landscape is actually going to look like, because it isn't just actually an issue of are the public going to feel safe or not. It'll also be are people going back into work in the office? Um, are they kind of still kind of doing the same sort of level of spending as they were previously? I mean, I've, I've got lots of friends who sort of lived in London. They've sort of moved, <laughs> I've got friends who've moved back to Yorkshire and literally doing their jobs in London, but from, from Yorkshire. And those are sort of people who would pre pandemic be kind of going to kind of like theatre concerts in London all the time. And I know lots of people are looking at th and thinking post pandemic, are we just going to go back to back to where we were before? Or is there going to be a, a bit of a shift in terms of working patterns, geography, locations? I think all our individual sectors are sort of looking at that, um, if not nervously, but looking at that kind of intently to try and work out what the post-pandemic landscape is gonna look like, because that will have a significant impact on things like audiences um, and audience demand. Really good point. And I guess an impact on travel as well. Um, attitudes toward travel may have changed um, during this course as well. Um, and perhaps even attitudes toward climate and sustainability, which is of course something that um, has always been a priority and, and was increasingly so um, over the course of the past year or so, um, but might be even more so as we look to return um, or not to offices um, after this period. Um, the Just moving on to the kind of very welcome 1.57 billion culture recovery fund um, and how that's impacted on organisations across the sector. It has been a lifeline for many. Um, Tarek, I know that um, Battersea Arts Centre received that um, directly. How has that worked for you? Um, and how has that worked for others who you've worked with across the sector as well this year? I mean, definitely, definitely in the world of live performance and theatre, it has been, <clears throat> excuse me, an absolute lifeline. And that's, um, no exaggeration and I think we really have to welcome the kind of support that the government's shown for the culture industries in that period. I mean for us like many we'd already had to have a very significant cost-cutting exercise in order to kind of be sustainable through this year um, but what the money does do is enables us to keep being active and proactive and not in danger of a constant cash crisis which was hanging over us through that period so <clears throat> excuse me it's very significant, um, but it obviously doesn't solve everything. I think next year is going to be incredibly hard. 
because as we say, there may not be sort of support funds available the way there were this year, but we still expect to have reduced audiences and reduced income through that period. So I think that the challenge for organizations is how to keep working, but also hold enough for next year as well. And I think what everyone will touch on is clearly that hasn't reached the freelancer community and the other, the other groups of people who we absolutely rely on. So there's now a responsibility and a pressure on us to try to share that money in a way that enables those people to come out in, in good shape as well. Fantastic. And do you think beyond, um, I know that the Cultural Recovery Fund um, covers organisations up until March, beyond that point, you mentioned that you still won't be able to be back up to kind of um, full operating capacity. Uh, do you suspect further support will be needed for both yourselves, but also colleagues working across the sector? I think support will be needed, but whether support is forthcoming, I'm not so sure. I think, you know, the culture industry has done really well relative to other industries in terms of support. Who knows what's going to happen? Obviously, we'll be campaigning hard for support. But I think given the challenges everyone is facing, I think we need to be prepared that there's no more coming. And so we're trying to set aside or put in business plans to enable us to operate effectively in that period. That's our assumption. So you're preparing for that scenario. OK, that's really helpful. Um, and then, Jamie, how has it landed across um, the music sector? Who has it helped and who hasn't it helped? Yeah, it's a very similar experience with Tarex, actually. It's uh, been a lifeline for venues and organisations um, that needed support, and it's meant they can continue up until March 31st. Um, it hasn't necessarily got through to freelancers um, and people working in... Um, uh, in in the sector as much as it, as it might have done. I mean, there have been examples of some settlements that were kind of had conditions whereby they had, they had to be employing people or it had to kind of get through to certain people, which was welcome. But on the whole, there is still a lot of pressure on self-employed freelancers. I think the way we see it going forward is, well, one, hugely, uh, hugely welcome, and we welcomed it across the sector, uh, that the government actually has provided sector-specific support um, to the cultural industries. I know there's lots of industries that have felt uh, felt like they haven't potentially had the support they kind of all the recognition they sort of like wanted or needed over the past six months. It should be really encouraging to us as a cultural sector that the government sort of looked across the economy and thought in terms of sectors that actually deserve and need support, it's important that we protect our cultural infrastructure. It's important that we kind of protect this stuff and make sure it's still there at the end of the pandemic. And that is encouraging. Um, but when it comes to March 31st, the way I'm sort of trying to phrase the question is it's not about do we have more support or don't have more support? It's how do we protect our cultural infrastructure for the, for the long term? And there's two ways you can either do that. You can either do that with a continuation of the Cultural Recovery Fund, um, which, I mean, for many organisations, it has been funding to make sure they can be mothballed. And, I mean, some have been continuing to do things, but some have sort of not really been functioning. Um, they haven't really been doing activity, but the Cultural Recovery Fund has meant that they can survive until the end of the pandemic. So you can kind of continue the CRF in that form, or you can have support to get to a situation where you can be up and running as a sector and supporting yourself. Um, we, in particular the music industry, but across the creative industries and cultural industries, we are a massively self-sufficient, self-sustaining um, industry that in normal times can support, it, can support itself. Um, we're not sort of, we're not asking for an extension to the CRF just because we're sort of like desperate for subsidy all the time. We kind of can't, can't survive by ourselves. In normal times, we can survive by ourselves. We are one of those sectors that will actually be driving the post-pandemic recovery when it comes. And actually, I'm, I'm sort of, I think we, I'm, we're, we're trying to frame it to government as sort of, listen, you can either help us get up, get on our own two feet and be financially and well, be safe and financially viable, be that through kind of like testing, vaccines, et cetera or we can have a continuation of the Cultural Recovery Fund to make sure that our organisations and venues are still protected. I mean, either way, it has to be one of those two. I'd probably prefer it to be the, <laughs> to be the one where we can be back on our own two feet and supporting ourselves, but it needs to be one or the other. And I, I, again, we're, we're trying not to frame it as a question of do we get more support or don't we get more support. We, it's about making sure that we get support to support ourselves, um, essentially, because I think that's what everyone wants. It's whether or not it's kind of support from government or support from, um, from our own sort of commercial activities, we just want to make sure that we're surviving as a sector and are there to play that key part in the, in the recovery phase. That's a really good point. And um, you touched on something else just at the end there um, as well, which is that um, the expectation isn't just on government now going forward for ensuring this kind of long-term sustainability it is on our own industry um, and what can we do as an industry perhaps to kind of step, step up and, and help in the interim. Um, and then Neil, I know that the BFI have been responsible for disseminating some of the um, cultural recovery funds. Um, are you able to outline what, what, what that has been and how that's landed? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just to echo what's already been said, um, 
90%, the, the furlough scheme has also helped incredibly because 90% of cinema staff have been effectively furloughed from March and then brought back in when cinemas were allowed to be open. And uh, the fund that we have is, is focusing on supporting independent cinemas, which make up about 40% of all cinemas in the UK and are kind of crucial to that regional uh, kind of arts um, uh, community um, centre that, that, that actually a lot of the time is kind of the heart of the, the cultural activity in, in, in particular uh, regions. So it's kind of really important that we have supported them and we've been working with the sector uh, very carefully to make sure that what they're asking for will definitely get them through to the end of the March. So there should be announcements in the next couple of weeks um, and 85% of those who have been eligible have actually applied for the funding. Um, and I do think it, it would have helped the sector survive. Uh, I think it's been invaluable. Um, the, the, just again, to echo what has already been said, ha however, we're not looking for subsidy in the long term. Um, I think we need certainty. And for the independent sector that actually does know its local audiences very well uh, and does have a history of um, programming independent films and um, also to have seasons which they know will, will, will feed into the appetite of that local um, audience, they still do require some kind of certainty around what they will be able to distribute moving forward. So um, it does go back to being able to program those bigger um, releases into their schedule, which actually allow them to have the income streams that they need in order to do their more uh, niche programming. So I think that that is the most important thing in March is to ensure that there is again, you know, that confidence that um, they will be able to plan for the next year, um, rather than trying to work out whether or not they can open within the next few weeks, and if they do open, what what exactly they're going to show. So confidence and, and certainty are really key there. And actually, in in the context of still not knowing the outcomes of our negotiations with the EU, um, that's added uncertainty. Um, uh, at what we're finding across the wider creative industries is is not helping at all either. Um, Neil, I'm going to stick with you and, and move on to freelancers, um, which we've already partly touched on, but freelancers, of course, make up um, a third of our workforce, much higher than many other industries, um, but many are falling through the gaps in government support and continue um, to do so. Um, how has the kind of film and TV industry stepped up, really, to help these kind of workers? No, no, when um, COVID first hit you know the industry the production side of the industry shut overnight you know we went from full employment to zero employment um, and a lot of those people fell outside of the job retention schemes that were being put in place um, and so that kind of immediate response was trying to find ways to get them covered but there came a point when we realized that um, government was unable to increase its support and it has like i said put a, a huge amount of money into furlough schemes and has been very flexible in allowing us to capture some of the production freelancers that were effectively on PAYE. So um, once, once that became apparent, um, the film and TV charity uh, helped by raising, I think it was three million pounds, uh, which they then distributed to those most in need. And I think there's, there's potentially going to be another round of announcements uh, from that fund. Um, we've also had money coming out of the Welsh Government and Screen Scotland too, which has been invaluable to those who suddenly had no income stream whatsoever. Um, but then it kind of switched to getting the uh, industry back to work as quickly as possible, which we've discussed before around production protocols. Um, I think what's really important is moving forward, how do we ensure that we're able to retain uh, our kind of key workers, our freelancers, because some of them have just reconsidered whether or not they want to work in an industry which can be so fickle in a way that one moment they know that they can afford to pay their mortgage and then suddenly they are even unable to demonstrate and, uh, through their companies that they've set up to provide their services that they were earning enough to tap into any kind of scheme or, or, or support. So we may have lost people, there may have been people who, who have kind of moved on because of that uncertainty. Um, so we kind of got to look at that and, and work out as an industry how, how we can address that. Fantastic, thanks very much, Neil. Um, and going, coming back to you, um, Jamie, I know that the, the music industry has really stepped up to support um, its freelancers, given the volume of um, freelancers and self-employed workers um, across the sector. Um, can you outline a little bit about that and, and perhaps kind of touch on how we can build in a little bit more resilience um, to that vital part of our workforce? Yeah, it, it's been really inspiring, actually, um, the work that's happened across industry. I know actually across a lot of the creative and cultural industries where 
sort of hardship funds and industry bodies have really stepped up um, to, to support their um, to support to support their employees and support their musicians. I mean, uh, Help Musicians, uh, run by James a James a uh, Acoff, has been absolutely outstanding. They've raised millions of pounds um, for musicians across the industry uh, to support them. And it's it's key. I think it's key as well. We haven't just been. It's not the case that pandemic hit and we suddenly went to government Im immediately saying you need to help people work in the sector. The first response from industry was to sort of put its own hands in its own pockets, um, and people across the industry supporting people um, and making sure that we could try and get as many people as we could through this through this crisis. Um, the I mean, within the music industry, uh, actually, though, it's like seventy-two percent of people of people working in the industry are self-employed uh, freelancers. So we've been particularly exposed to the hardships uh, that self-employed have um, have faced over the past past few months. But I think there's a it's interesting what what Neil was just saying about uh, and kind of touching on the this issue of losing talent, losing creative talent. And I think there's a real there's a real case we need to continue to make partly to government, partly to public, but also to our own industry about the viability of jobs in our sectors kind of going forwards. Because the irony of this has been the jobs that have been most impacted by the pandemic are actually some of the jobs that should be most resilient in the future. So you also have this big debate about automation and what sort of jobs are going to be going or what sort of jobs are going to be staying. When you look at, I mean, there's so much research at the moment that suggests creative jobs, jobs in the creative and cultural sectors are the jobs that are going to be resilient to kind of automation. They're going to be the jobs of the future. They're going to be the sort of places we should be investing and focusing um, and sort of seeing really exciting things happening in the labour market over the next few years. Now, in a pandemic, when big live events uh, uh, not can't be happening, but big live events aren't really happening to the extent they were before, lots of people are finding their sort of out, uh, their jobs Aren't, aren't, aren't viable has sort of been the phrase that's sort of been banded around over the past few months. But I think we really need to make really clear that jobs that aren't viable during a pandemic is not job, it's not the same as jobs that aren't viable for the future. But it's actually the sort of jobs that have seen the biggest impact during this pandemic are the sort of jobs that should be the most stable, the most secure and the most resilient um, post pandemic. And it's another, it's just another reason why it's so important to be supporting this creative talent, supporting our freelancers and self-employed people. Because when we get to the end of the pandemic, those are the people who are going to be powering our industries. Those are the people who are going to be sort of helping lead this cultural and economic recovery post pandemic, which makes it even more important that we are, we're supporting them and making sure that they are, um, they're still in our sectors um, come, come the end of this pandemic. Absolutely. Um, and as you say, um, not just to help grow our own sector, but all parts of the economy um, and our society as well. Creative skills and creative jobs will be so vital. Um, and research has shown that. Um, Tarek, kind of moving on to you, how, how have you been supporting freelancers during this period, but also that, thinking about your kind of workforce and, and the kind of creative workforce more broadly, how do you think it's going to fare as we come out to the other side of this? And do you think we will have lost any talent or will our workforce have changed? I mean, like other organisations, we've tried to do our bit in our small way. So, for example, as um, Jamie and I are discussing, a lot of the industry has really stepped up itself. So we helped administer a sort of fundraising drive for freelancers called Gig Aid, which raised tens of thousands of pounds on a small basis. We've improved our contracts for artists in the last few months and also try to commission as much work as possible. But clearly what we can do as individual organizations is incredibly limited. I mean, we've got, in, we've got major structural problems in the way that our culture or industries are organized. And it reflects kind of similar structural problems across all the economy. So the way the money flows is that money flows primarily through larger organizations. And those larger organizations need a freelance workforce that for them is casual because they put on work at you know, different points. You want to work with a multitude of different artists and freelancers. So you create an environment where people are, are very insecure. And to answer your question, I think we have lost people and we will continue to lose people. But also, just as seriously, we're not attracting new people into the industry. We're not, you know, we're not improving our diversity and inclusion because we still haven't cracked this issue. I think the only way we are going to do this is to really focus on joint, joint working and joint sector wide initiatives to address this. Again, it's not something individual organizations can do, but you know, we, we, there are discussions in theater now about do we need a national portfolio of individuals or similar as we have a national portfolio of organizations to at least provide some security for a significant rump of the freelance workforce so they can work across multiple organizations without kind of financial risk associated to it. Do we need, uh, I mean, I used to work in the NHS. One of the great things about the NHS is we were a single employer in many senses, even though you work in different places across the country. Do we need consistent employment terms or other things that could benefit so that we also don't get 
um, freelancers draining into just the cities. For example. I mean, there's all sorts of big things, but I think we need major coordinated structural effort now because what we this crisis has shown is we are only as strong as our weakest link and currently our weakest link is our freelance community. Those are really brilliant ideas and I'll come back to you on those um uh, Tarek, after this after this session, because I'd love to pick those up with you. Um, and I guess there is a um, we've been making some calls on government to introduce, for example, a freelance commissioner to sit alongside the small business commission so that we can make some of those long term structural changes. But as you say, there is a lot. Government will move slowly um, and there's a lot that industry could do to help make some of those structural changes straight, straight away. So there's a there's a kind of responsibility on us to do to get together, as you say, and, and do that. And um, sticking with you, Tarek, so you mentioned you touched on kind of diversity of our workforce. Um, obviously, diversity and access and inclusion were, uh, was a kind of massive challenge even before the pandemic and potentially exacerbated now um, uh, as we uh, as we've gone through um, this kind of crisis period. And as we look to recover, um, what do you think we need to do as a matter of great urgency as a sector um, to ensure that we are encouraging that diverse pipeline of talent to come through? Yeah, I mean, the reason I'm smiling is because every time I think about this question and also get asked this question, it's always a question of what do we need to do um, in order to address what has been a consistent and very deep-seated and uh, set of inequalities and problems. But actually, I think part of, part of the solution is not what we do, but what we stop doing. <laughs> what we stop doing is putting up all these barriers and boundaries that are completely unnecessary, that are making it very difficult for people to access um, either the cultural output that we produce, which means they don't get engaged in it, they don't feel excited about it, it doesn't touch their lives or transform their lives in a way that's necessary, or it's very difficult in practice to work in those organizations. Now, if you think about the theaters just as a subset of the cultural industries, um, if you did an audit of how many of them are physically accessible in terms of their workspaces, never mind the auditoriums, but for people to be able to work in those offices, be a part of it, it is, it is absolutely shocking in terms of what's available in terms of accessibility. If you look at any recruitment drive for any cultural institution, the number of ridiculous requirements in terms of experience or educational requirements, or the fact that you need to have very specialist expertise in that subset of that cultural industry, completely ignoring all the expertise that sit outside of culture that we should be bringing into our industry. And um, again, we're creating problems that are just making it impossible for us to be diverse. Similarly, um, at BAC, we started making all our performances relaxed, which means people could move around, could participate in different ways, be themselves, seeing a huge uptick in terms of um, who's coming in and, and benefiting from that. And these will have long-term knock-on effects, but that wasn't about putting things in. It was just taking out the rules that go with theater going and saying, let's just be a bit more relaxed about it, guys, and not create so many boundaries. So maybe we just need to reverse the problem. It's really helpful steer. Um, and Neil, I know that you and the BFI have done a huge amount of work um, on this and, and, and that work continues. And um, what do you think now we need to kind of prioritise in what we do or, as Tarek says, don't do um, in the months to come? Uh, look, I think um, there is an opportunity here to actually ensure that we are moving the dial over time. I think and there's enough uh, that's been done around individual initiatives that are never really follow through and then don't actually have any long term impact. And I think now's the time where if we start to put in place the diversity standards in a very rigorous way and actually then start to measure the differences that, that those standards are making over time, um, we can look at what interventions we need to make which are genuinely going to be significant. And I think some of them are probably invisible ones, like, for instance, uh, work, uh, enabling the workforce to feel confident in terms of um, employment. So I think that freelancer environment uh, is a barrier, you know, because ultimately you do need financial um, stability to be able to commit to a career and encouraging people potentially from, um, you know, low socioeconomic background, which is hugely underrepresented within uh, the, the film and TV industry, is going to be difficult if they don't even think that there's a potential uh, job which would allow them to support you know, moving forward a family. So I think some of, some of the barriers are invisible, um, you know, hiring networks, uh, which aren't inclusive, um, means that you, you know, you get, get to hear people say, well, I, I just don't know where to find people from diverse backgrounds. Well, actually, that's because they're only looking in the same places that they've always looked. So there, there, there are certain initiatives that do need to be there to kind of short circuit those, those issues. And the opportunity actually is, we're a growth industry, as has been said, you know, creativity, creative industries are actually going to be a really important driver of growth. 
Um, I think this government is genuinely committed uh, to a levelling up agenda. And I think this is a chance for us to actually sit down and go, OK, what are the key levers that we can pull to ensure that when we move forward out of the pandemic crisis and actually into growth, and I think that, you know, our sectors have got huge growth potential, how do we make sure that actually we're doubling down on inclusion and diversity to get the new entrants in that will actually allow us to look in five years time at an industry that which is completely different to the one that we're currently in in terms of representation. Fantastic, thank you, Neil. Um, and because you've mentioned leveling up, do you think there will be a significant or sufficient shift in kind of working practices such that we can begin to recruit far more diversely across the country? Well, I, I think that will depend what we're asking of productions and what we're asking of future investment in, say, studio spaces uh, and skills investments um, and working closely with regions and nations on how to develop more sustainable businesses over time. Um, I think we it, it takes it will take an, uh, a focus on on putting in place criteria around public funding. Uh, also, how we're really engaging on the ground locally, so to actually getting on the ground and finding those training centres which we might not know yet will provide the people who will work on the sets in Liverpool or in Glasgow or anywhere around the UK. So I, th I think it, it does require a lot of kind of detailed on the ground hands on work. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, and Jamie, I know that UK Music has um, just recently published a, a report um, on diversity um, and access with some really quite precise recommendations. And how are you looking to take some of those forward now? Yeah, so we put out our diversity report about, uh, about a month ago, um, and it had quite a bold and ambitious 10 point plan in it, because when you look at it, actually some of the numbers in terms of the re in terms of recent years in terms of people from particularly ethnic minorities um and um and different genders coming in there's been really positive progress what you're starting to see is actually that progress not necessarily being ma matched at sort of senior levels within the industry so one of the things we've got is trying to make sure that the positive progress we've sort of seen in terms of boost and diversity is being seen at all levels of the business and all levels of the industry um and the thing i just probably add really briefly is um uh Geographic diversity as well, which has always been, I think, a really important one and one that often isn't talked about enough in the cultural sector. Um, it's been really interesting to see what happens with that over the next coming months, because a lot of the cultural sector find itself just kind of rooted in London and the southeast, um, when actually there's potential and capacity and demand for it across the across across the country. Um, and there's actually a live question that I did this. This was sort of generated by a conversation I had with Tarek last week, where I I previously thought. Um, great actually lots of kind of people are now able to work remotely lots of people aren't necessarily kind of all based in london does this mean you're going to have people kind of working working our kind of creative and cultural industries from all across the country you know our kind of our industries are going to look more reflective the uk as a whole but actually there's a counterpoint to that which is now it's so much easier for you to be doing things digitally and through technology and doing remote work are we just going to see a lot more things suck towards london and the southeast i think it's something we should be quite aware of and guarded against as a as an industry and as a sector Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, and I don't know where the past 45 minutes has gone because it's been such an insightful um, and interesting conversation, but we are now um, out of time. That brings us to the end of today's panel. Um, massive thank you for joining us, Jamie, Neil and Tarek. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your time um, and insights um, on what uh, is needed now for recovery and, and how we've seen impact on our sectors uh, um, uh, uh, over over recent months. We'll see some of you shortly for the questions, uh, question and answer session um, and look forward to seeing you soon. Um, we are now live, I think, and just waiting for all of our panelists to um, join, but um, welcome back to those uh, who joined us for the panel discussion. And now we're moving into um, just over half an hour of Q&A. Um, just to quickly reintroduce our panellists, we have Tarek Iskander, who is the Artistic Director and Chief Executive of London's Battersea Arts Centre, um, Jean Jamie Noku Goodwin, uh, the new Chief Executive of UK Music, and Neil Peplow, who is Director of International Affairs um, at the British uh, Film Institute. And I can see that all of our panellists are on line now which is uh, which is fantastic um good afternoon so um if you could direct any questions to uh me in the chat function on hopin um putting at caroline julian before them that would be fantastic and i'll try and keep an eye on those um as they come in um i can see that there is already a question um that's popped up for jamie so a question from um from the audience jamie given what uh, you've said about creatives being at the forefront of the recovery 
what new lobbying do we need to do to get that message across? Good question. Great question. Um, I think, uh, while it's demonstrating how it, well, the, the role that the role of creators and we free not to sort of play um, in our ecosystem um, is particularly important. I think one of the things also I've tried to be making sure we're kind of getting across is the impact that um, the impact that this pandemic has had on people, not just financially, but also creatively. And I know sometimes when you kind of talk about the creative impact on, on, on people, it can sort of, sort of sound like you're just being, oh, it's been really, it's kind of been really hard if you can't kind of be, be performing or kind of doing the things you love. But actually, when you think about it, if you're a, if you're a musician, um, if you're an actor, I mean, you don't normally do it for the money. You don't do it because there's these huge paychecks every uh, kind of every, every month or at the end of the week. You do it because you love it. Um, you do it because it's sort of a way of life. It's a livelihood. Um, and one of the big impacts we've had in the past 12 months has been people not just struggling financially, but also unable to, unable to perform, unable to do what they love. Um, it's had a huge impact on people's mental health in particular. Um, and I think a lot more of that is going to become evident over the next couple of months. But it is, I think, winning the argument in terms of what we need to be doing in terms of lobbying, um, showing that as a sector, the talent, the creative talent pipeline and the creative talent infrastructure we've got is is a key part of infrastructure as well. So if you look at things like the Cultural Recovery Fund, I think part of the approach government had, which you can completely understand, was protect the cultural infrastructure um, and make sure that we could work. Without, without our cultural infrastructure, um, then a lot of the sector would sort of fall down. And that's true, but it's not, when we talk about infrastructure, we shouldn't just be talking about buildings. We shouldn't just be talking about venues and organisations. Actually, like we have a creative infrastructure as well. And our creative infrastructure is something that other countries look at us with envy. Um, we have got one of the, we've got some of the best creative talent in the UK, uh, in the UK right here in this country. Um, and doing everything we can to protect it should be um, should be a priority. Again, it, it's not it's not just a case of if we do nothing for 12 months, then everyone could just bounce back to where they are. The work that goes into kind of work in the sector is almost people need to kind of keep match fit. People need to kind of be ready to come back and do what they were doing before. And it's not the case you can just switch on or switch off sort of creative talent. It's something we need to be supporting throughout the um, throughout the pandemic and going forward. Fantastic. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and I'm going to add my own question off the back of that, if, if, if that's all right, because um, we at the Creative Industries Federation have also been giving thought with the wider sector as to our kind of campaign and advocacy work next year. Um, how much do you think we need to target um, the general public um, alongside government as we now move to make the case for the creative industries and our value uh, in recovery and growth? Totally. I mean, one, of the, one of the nice things about living in a democracy means if when you want to pressure government, it's part of the way it's kind of getting the public on your side with things. Um, and I think there has been a real, well, there's a moment where I think the public really appreciates us as a sector and the workforce um, and people working across the sector, probably more than ever, because you, the, what's the saying? You, you don't know what you've got until you, well, you don't really miss something until it's gone. Um, and I think that we've all missed the, the kind of the cultural sector and the creative sector. We've all missed the sort of live events and things that we would have previously kind of go into. Um, and even though, again, as um, as we said in the last, in the last panel a lot of stuff well some stuff has been happening it hasn't been happening the same way it was before and i know a lot of people miss that and i think it feels like there's a moment where why we can get so much more public buy-in to the plight of people working in our sectors but also the importance of people working in our sectors um, and really making the case that not just the government uh, can get it but also the public understand that when it comes to where this country is going to be succeeding over the next years it's in our creative and cultural industries and a key part of that is our is our creative and cultural sector i mean these are these are I keep I keep describing these jobs as the jobs of the future, and the, the, the little joke I always have is I know the um, that advert about Fatima and the kind of ballet dancer saying her next job might be in um, might be in cyber, which um, again I, I worked in government previously, and everyone who was saying that was a big conspiracy. I mean I wish I, I wish government had the ability to be able to be as coordinated in a, in a put down as that. Um, it was one of those annoying silly things that sort of suggested people didn't really get the importance of the creative sector. Actually, when you look at it, if you look at where the job market's going, if you look at kind of how resilient the creative sector is to automation, I mean, in a few years' time, you should, we should be having adverts where saying, looking at a cyber technician saying, this person's next job could be in theatre, this person's next job could be in music. Because actually, this is where the jobs of the future are. This is where the people should be looking at in terms of future employment. And that's important to get across to, pe to parents. It's important to get across to the public. And it's important to really make sure there's that public recognition of the fact that in the creative sector, people working in our sectors, people who've kind of got future careers in our sector, they're viable, they're viable good careers to be doing. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, and I can see that another question has just come through on the chat and Tarek, I might kind of come to you first on that. Um, 
So Maeve has said, um, aside from obvious financial support, um, what have been the biggest concerns from individuals, independent companies um, in uh, the sector um, that you have seen or heard? So I guess we touched on this in our, uh, in our panel, but didn't really think about wider impacts beyond running of the business and uh, finance and workers. So Tarek, um, do you want to come back on that question? Yeah, and Caroline, can I just check you can hear me? Is that right? Yes, yes, you yeah. can. Um, I mean, the financial is clearly highly high up there in terms of the major kind of crises. But beyond that, I think, I think being an artist or being a creative is, is quite precarious at the best of times. And I think what you often need is a sense of affirmation, a sense of self-worth, a sense of achieving something positive and changing the world. And that usually comes through commissions and being able to create work, but also interacting with audiences for that immediate feedback and that immediate response. And I guess all those things have been really missing at this kind of particular period. I think one of the things that artists have really needed and where they've got to really benefited from is the support or the ability to restructure how they create so that they can engage directly in communities, be out in communities working rather than relying on cultural spaces to make those interactions happen, shifting work online or into digital media and bringing some of their creativity into those aspects. So I think I think artists like everyone just need to work and just need to feel affirmed in that work and see the value of what they're doing. And that's been as important as the money, though the two clearly go hand in hand to some extent. Uh, fantastic answer to that question. Um, and I guess hopping, can I hop back to the first question that was, was asked and, and direct that to uh, you, Tarek? If, if we are to communicate better the kind of value um, of our sector and the impact of, of the creative industries, um, how do you think we need to start thinking about that as a sector um, and how do we need to start communicating that impact? Well, I think I think to be critical for a moment, I think considering we are the creative industries, I think the story we've told about ourselves has been abysmal for the last 12 months and it's been a failure of communication and, and creativity, partly because the story has been, to some extent, we are shut, we can't operate, we're in crisis, we need help, all of which as we are all, all of us saying in this call is A, not true, and be not helpful, but also we we never empowered our communities themselves to be the ones to advocate for us. You know, I didn't see enough um, young people advocating for the culture industries. People rely on consistently shouting about it, and so that has led to kind of particular problems across the board. So um, we just need to get people to speak for us rather than feel that we need to shout ourselves constantly and we we have the ability we are directors we are creative people we are filmmakers we should be able to make that happen better than most i think that's a really fair point um, and a really good challenge to us all as we look to take our kind of uh, lobbying efforts over the course of the next year um neil can i um uh, dr uh, direct one of the questions at you so um i know that many across our sector have been looking at different ways of engaging audiences and uh, kind of pivoting their business models to um, to become more digital um, and to make sure that they are um, driving revenue, but also able to make their creative products and services um, available to wider audiences. What's been the case in, in film and TV? Has there been any pivoting there? And if so, um, what's that looked like? No, I, I think obviously the, the first lockdown uh, meant that viewing habits changed rapidly. Um, uh, 50, they, they, we did a survey and 56% uh, of people said, one of their activities to get through lockdown was um, watching uh, film on uh, films on TV, uh, compared to fifty four percent who said that act exercising outside of home was their main activity. So actually, watching films was was a bigger activity than going for a walk, um, and that also kind of was borne out by the stats. Um, so in April twenty nineteen, people were watching on average four hours and fifty three minutes of screen time a day. Um, in April twenty twenty, it was more like uh, six and a half hours. Uh, and it completely shifted the way that people also engaged um, with kind of TV and film on other streaming platforms. So 70% use Netflix, 43% use Prime Video. Uh, and it started to allow big companies like Disney experiment around releases, for instance, like Mulan, because suddenly Mulan was available on Disney and you could buy it. And they just didn't think about even releasing it uh, into cinemas because they were experimenting about price point, how many people are going to download it. And they're going to do the same with a, a, a film called Soul, which they're releasing for free on Disney Plus on Christmas Day. So you've got big studios experimenting with Windows and, and whether or not they need to be as reliant as they have been on big cinema releases. And I think 
you know, the conclusion they've come to is that cinema is still really important and will never be replaced as kind of a major income stream. However, they can experience, they can experiment with things like day and day release. Uh, they can experiment with uh, different pricing models. And that is something that they're going to kind of continue to do, I think, for the next couple of years. Uh, kind of on the independent uh, cinema side, it's meant that festivals, for instance, have had to rethink the way that they've engaged audiences and, you know, can went online. London Film Festival had a hybrid model of being in venue and also online. And actually what we found is a lot of positive has, has come from the, that experimentation. So um, at the London Film Festival, we, we've reached a bigger audience than ever before. Um, and it's actually allowed us to strategize in terms of regional delivery. So partnership with regional cinemas and partnerships, which we will be looking to continue on. Um, and I think even the bigger chains like, for instance, View and Odeon are looking at diversifying the type of content that they're going to put on their screens because suddenly the question is asked who owns their business is it them or the studios who you know they're reliant on for those bigger tentpole releases uh, and I think they're suddenly thinking well maybe we need to diversify the types of films that we should be programming so we're not over reliant on uh, a certain number of big tentpole releases a year so um, th there has been accelerated disruption um, and I think it's actually also an opportunity for uh, UK independent cinema to find new ways of engaging uh, directly with with, with audiences. Um, globally, I, I think the one thing which uh, I think we should mention is the reach of creative industries and the impact it has internationally in terms of how um, other territories we see the UK and that kind of importance of soft power, especially when free trade agreements are being negotiated worldwide, uh, you know, post uh, EU is really essential to ensure that, that countries see us as you know this creative hub uh, which they, they would want to travel to and do business with. So I think working out next how to have that international reach is something that we'll be looking at with the Global Screen Fund, which uh, we got uh, funding for from the DCMS and the last spending review to push that message that you know we are creative, we're open for business, and we have a heritage in, in um, storytelling in, in our particular sector. Fantastic. Thank you so much for those um, for those insights, Neil. Um, I'm going to direct one of the, the questions that I directed at Jamie and Tarek um, to you as well, because I think Julia's um, um, building on her kind of earlier point and just asking for our reflections on whether we really do think um, encouraging the general public to become our champions is um, is the way to influence government. I um, just wondered if you wanted to offer any reflections on that. That's directed at you, Neil, sorry. So uh, how, how we can turn um, audiences into uh, advocates for, for yeah, our industry. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I think uh, they they do that by engaging with, our, with, with, with what we make, especially in the film and TV sector. It's, it's you know, the audience reaction to great UK TV series and films, which kind of demonstrate the value of that sector. I, th I think understanding that there, there are opportunities available actually in terms of careers within our industry is also incredibly important because at the moment we, we have been centered uh, around the Southeast and it's kind of ensuring that any opportunities that, that there are in the future as we continue to grow are spread around the regions and also nations. And I think it's important to ensure that actually this isn't kind of an elite um, pastime which is limited to just a particular type of person who can afford to go into this sector. We should ensure that moving forward, we, we, we are open and we are inclusive and we do the work to, to, to get a, a different um, pipeline coming into the industry, which is more reflective of the UK as a whole. Because I think once we do that and once people understand, well, actually this isn't just, you know, a hobby or a pastime, but actually genuinely a career which the government has recognised and, and continues to recognise as really important for economic growth, uh, then perhaps we'll, we'll get over that barrier that it's a, something over there that happens which doesn't necessarily relate uh, to the majority of the people in the country. Um, I mean, the, the, the film and TV sector actually kept um, the UK out of recession uh, in the last quarter last year, um, just because of the increase in production that we've been getting. And it's predicted that we'll get £6.1 billion pounds worth of of production um, in, within the next three years. And what we need are people to actually come in and work in the industry to fulfill that demand. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's a complicated story to get them to understand, but I think it's, it has to be driven with 
that that main message of inclusion that, that this is something yeah. for everybody that everyone can celebrate and that actually has a benefit yeah and it sounds like i think you make a really good point in there and that um that message needs to be communicated in a really participatory way so through the creative products and services that we engage people with and a diverse range of people with um and not just marketing that message at them as it were yeah. um, so perhaps yeah. that's a challenge to take away um for us and think about and um, jamie i can see that you're you're keen to come in off, off the back of that Ooh. oh you're on mute jamie so yeah i just wanted to jump in on the, off the back of that i think it's really important when we're talking about champions um having other sectors advocating for us is incredibly important. So you'd expect me to talk about how important the music industry is and how, how much support the music industry needs. You'd expect tax, how important the theatre industry and the kind of need, and, and Neil, the same for screen, screen industry. Actually, one of the things our, set, our wide, the wider cultural and creative sector has in its favour is we have a benefit on a whole load of other industries that are actually very well disposed towards us. So one of the things I'm trying to get the music industry talking much more about is one, well, um, things like social prescribing and the impact of music on art and on mental health and well-being is really important. And there are lots of clinicians in the NHS who think it's really important. Having clinicians talk about the positive benefits of culture and the creative industries really important having hospitality i mean bars bars and pubs have been suffering quite a lot in the last year not just because they've been legally shut down because a lot of their football actually comes from the nighttime economy and live events with there's no big music festivals and there's no kind of big uh, kind of like theater shows west end stuff happening bars and pubs have basically been really hit by that and the hospitality sector essentially thinks that um the live live performances and the creative and cultural sector is really key for them to succeed and it's one thing when you've got the creative sector saying the creative sector needs support but when you can kind of harness um, an army of advocates and you can have like NHS clinicians saying how important the sector is and people in education saying how important the sector is people in the hospitality sector saying how important the sector is it essentially makes government sit up and listen because they realize we are a key part of our, our our economic but also cultural ecosystem and us doing well isn't just good for us the sector it's also good for the economy and kind of society as a whole so I think really making making that case and looking outside our own our own individual steps for those advocates and those people who would champion our cause is especially important really really fantastic point um and it picks up on a, a kind of fascinating discussion we had with some of our um education uh, members just yesterday about potentially influencing and targeting the next generation as well so if we're looking at campaigning in the long term making sure that those who become not just the future workers within our sector but say future mps um is going to be really very important so i wonder whether there's an immediate um gain as well as a kind of medium to long term one as well and whether we can sneak that message through some of as you say neil some of the messaging that we need to get across around creative careers um, and that being a kind of growth growth opportunity there um, Jamie, whilst we're still with you, um, Sam has kind of put into the chat um, uh, a question about uh, what extra support costs are needed uh, just to survive through this period. So looking particularly at kind of, um, I guess, live events. Are, is UK Music making any particular asks there at the moment just to kind of tide us through? I know we touched on this very briefly in the, in the panel discussion just now, but are there any particular asks that will just help us get through to spring? Yeah, so we did. It's it, actually Neil, Neil touched on this. And it's really important. Um, certainty is, I think, certainty is one of the biggest ones because I think there are, there are some industries. If you give them twenty four hour notice, they can kind of like bounce back and be ready to go. Um, we're not necessarily one of those, um, especially when you're looking at big festivals, which sort of need six months lead in to sort of be preparing for. Um, even if you kind of when you're looking at kind of more major events with a few thousand people in them, not the same size as big kind of festivals like like Glastonbury or Reading, but those you know, small events, they still need kind of months of plans and preparation. And again, like the the vaccine news today has been very encouraging. A lot of the mood music from government is sort of being around. We think we might be able to kind of be having things happening from April, May. But unless we have certainty of that as a sector, what we don't want to do is start planning for stuff, start putting a lot of money into things and then finding it kind of being stopped for various reasons or the pandemic has taken a turn for the worst, finding we can't do it. So ensuring you've got certainty is a big one. Um, and then almost off the back of that, insurance is the other issue we're, we're coming up against um, QC. Um, uh, major insurers basically are very nervous about insuring that events, um, understandably given what's happened in the last 11, 12 months. But it means finding ways to ensure major events happening has been particularly difficult. And one of the things we're kind of engaged with government with and working with government on is can we have some sort of um, help when it comes to insurance? Because that is the big hurdle that we've got as a sector towards getting things up and running over the next few months. It would be a the way I've been putting it is it'll be a it'll be a tragedy if you get to summer and 
actually as a combination of vaccine and testing we've got into a really good place against the virus and we've got the, the conditions are there for us to be having major events but then because simply for lack of preparation time a lot of those major events didn't happen because we didn't have the warning or the preparation time to be able to hold them so certainty is, 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 is a big one I think. Great thank you so much Jimmy um, and another question that's come through and um, which I will direct at um, Tarek so um, how do the panel believe attitudes to paying for creative content will be affected by the pandemic really interesting question um Tarek what are your views on that big really good question I mean I think the evidence it's interesting because particularly in live performance and theatre I feel there's been a huge uh, I'm trying to find a plight where we've flooded a load of uh, online activity and not all of it fantastic quality and I think the evidence is that um people's willingness to pay for that content is quite mixed. So where the effort has been put in to make very specific made for digital content or that still contains the live element, people do want to pay a premium for that, but not for anything. I, I think, I, I, again, I'd turn the question slightly around is that I think people's ability to pay is also going to be heavily impacted. We're obviously heading into a very, very major recession. Uh, the job numbers are really disturbing across the board. The question I'm asking myself is not how we can charge more for our content, but how we can make our content more um, financially accessible. For example, at BAC, we are now going to make everything we do pay what you can or free going forward from spring onwards. And we've used this opportunity to restructure our business to enable that to happen. Um, I think it's fair to say for us that digital, what we're learning in theatre anyway, is that digital media is not is not a brilliant way of raising money it's not a brilliant way of getting people to pay for tickets but it is a brilliant way of increasing audience reach and accessing people who haven't accessed our work before internationally nationally and so on so i think as as a way of um, making our art get to everyone it's fantastic but i don't think we're going to find a really good way of monetizing this anytime soon that's a really interesting insight and is there um tarik i know you touched on this in the main panel session but for those who who went on that um is there are you looking at other kind of revenue streams almost kind of offset that so that you can make such things kind of accessible more widely accessible and free we are and i think uh one of interesting for us one of the most resilient parts of it because we have multiple businesses operating to kind of fund the artwork is our enterprises and different or you know events businesses are running really well but also for example we, we used to tour a lot of activity internationally um and uh, obviously that completely stopped overnight like everything else but we've been filming made for digital works that we are also now touring internationally so we recently shared a kind of digital piece with hong kong international festival and made and going back to the environmental sustainability point you were making earlier caroline that feels like a real glimpse into the future so i think yes there may be specific opportunities as well that open up i also think that we might be operating all of us might be operating in an environment where there is just less money uh, across the board and I think it's it's a question of adapting to that and working out how we can maximize what we've got. Fantastic thank you so much Tarek um, and Neil very similar question um, to you how do you think attitudes um, uh, will have changed or will have been affected by the pandemic if at all um, in terms of paying for creative content? Um, I actually you know historically um, cinema emissions have gone up during recessions because it's seen as an affordable uh, form of entertainment outside of the home. So uh, whether or not that will sustain uh, after you know the, the impact, the negative impact that the economy is going to take over the next couple of years, we will find out. But I do think uh, in terms of pay for in-home entertainment, people are now very used to paying subscriptions. And I think um, if you have a subscription digital platform, that's a model which is globally scalable and it's the big global streamers that have effectively already covered that side of the market. The, the more difficult area will be uh, individual trans transaction model because if people are already paying for two or three subscription services, they might be reluctant to pay $3.99 for an individual download. So that might be an issue in that not only have DVD sales over the last 10 years dropped off a cliff, transactional video on demand may also be impacted by the fact that people feel that they're already paying for their in-home entertainment so why should they pay an additional three four quid to, to add to their costs yes got some kind of big challenges um uh, going forward particularly as you say as we head into this kind of economic crisis and, and the session of the next year um i mean there's a neil i'll come back to you um, again on this next question this is a massive question um 
uh, that uh, that requires us to get our crystal balls out. But what what do you think the UK's creative industries will look like in five years' time? So um, I guess how how do you see that market um, developing and evolving? Um, and what will we look like in terms of um, well, kind of growth status? Are there some subsectors that might grow more than others? Do you think it will digital feature even more so than before? Look, it's difficult to predict, predict for every single creative sector because, you know, um, it, it, it's probably very different for each. Uh, however, I think at the core, there will be, as has been said, a need for creativity in the roles which they're going to have longevity moving forward, where uh, um, AI can replace process driven routine. Um, it will need humans to step in and add creativity in order to differentiate um, from that kind of process uh, driven model. So I think as a whole, creativity is going to be, as has been said, incredibly important to the future economy. Um, in terms of film and TV sector, I think there'll be a shift in terms of production. Uh, so the virtual sets are now um, being introduced. So if anyone's seen The Mandalorian on Disney Plus, you'll see what the virtual set can achieve. It also, it means you don't have to travel to deserts in order to be able to shoot in a desert. You can now do it in a studio and you use a gaming engine to do it. So we're seeing new jobs already being created around that. So a virtual location manager. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in, in that area that can then also bleed into other industries. So for instance, when I was in Australia, uh, one of the key uh, demands from the mining industry were for people who understood um, VR and AR because then they could map um, where the minerals were uh, against geological reports. Uh, even Walmart, uh, Australia exports 90% of all wool in the world, believe it or not. They were using AR app to demonstrate how their wool was more effective than other wool and VR. And they were using this huge amount of creativity across all industries. And I think that's where you know the creative industries will not be this, this very easy to define sector. Uh, my hope is that you know everything from storytelling and telling stories in a way which is engaging and allowing you know potential customers to understand your brand and, and why they should be associated with it, all the way through to you know the more technical CGI coding side, will, will have spread across all industries and actually the government will see the and recognise the importance of introducing that into the curriculum at an early stage and then allowing people to understand that there are sustainable careers which will support them. Um, uh, you know, rather than, you know, something which happens uh, outside of the curriculum as, as a pastime that might develop into something further down the line. Fantastic. Um, so quite kind of ambitious vision as well for, for the creative industries in the next five years. I really hope that we can we can realise much of that. Um, and Tarek, um, I'm going to come to you next. And there is also the same question to you about kind of crystal ball five years time. Um, but also I, I've noticed that Sam has um, popped a question in the chat about um, the NT Live um, type model. Um, uh, that I know that many other um, theatres and also yourselves has kind of, uh, have kind of adopted. And um, what might be the growth of that as well, in particular, um, uh, over the next five years, if if any, or will we just see a kind of return to audiences and uh, and stick with that kind of traditional model, as it were? Yeah, interesting. I don't, I don't know is the honest answer. I was talking to colleague. I mean, the, the the important thing to say about the NT Live model is the NT Live model is extreme. I'll answer this question first. Is extremely expensive. Um, and so the, the organizations that can produce, um, capture at that level of quality and then share it um, are very few. So you talk about the National Theatre, you talk about the RSC and a few other really large organizations, which means that model is not very replicable for organ mid-scale organizations like ours or smaller scale organizations. I, I was interested to see the NT have obviously just released, released their streaming service themselves. Um, so they're releasing capture, which you can subscribe to in a subscription model. So it'd be interesting to see how that works. I think the challenge for places like the National Theatre is those productions that are being streamed are extremely expensive to put on and obviously rely on significant live audience numbers for, for a period to fund them. So I imagine the model will still exist, particularly for the big brands and culture like NT, RSC, Sadler's Wells and so on. But we there may be slightly smaller productions that are being streamed till audience numbers come to the ground. But there's definitely a future for it. But I think from speaking to all those organisations, None of them see it as a big money owner either. Again, it's a really a way of getting audiences and kind of engaging with their work. Uh, crystal ball time, I guess if we're being super positive, I can imagine a world that is much more inclusive, that we have really collaborated together and addressed some of the freelancer insecurities that we were talking about earlier. But interestingly, I also think 
clearly the bigger organizations have been shaken the hardest. And I guess, again, talking about theater specifically, the, the more proscenium arch large traditional theater infrastructure you have, the more vulnerable you are feeling. And being speaking personally, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think if we see a kind of weakness in the infrastructure, what we might see grow up around it is really exciting. I mean, again, going back to my own history, when we felt really excluded by the theatre industry, we built our own theatre with £10,000 in a warehouse in East London, which is now a national portfolio organisation. Think about all those spaces in the high street that have now become redundant because they can't operate as Debenham, frustratingly. Um, but then what are all those? Those are new potential cultural grassroots spaces that communities and artists can take over themselves. So I'm actually hoping for a bit more of a guerrilla um, freestyle, slightly more risk taking grassroots infrastructure than we have currently. It probably cost a lot less as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tarek. I love the idea of um, re we haven't really touched on this kind of revitalizing our high streets and encouraging the kind of attraction of uh, creatives and others to use that space. Um, and use it for their kind of their kind of needs. I wonder whether the Chancellor announced this kind of four billion um, leveling up funds last week in his spending with you. I wonder if there's a way of influencing that just to encourage begin to kind of encourage that that process. Um, I think that would be really exciting. Um, Jamie, can I ask you to look into your crystal ball? Yeah, it's really interesting what Tarek was just just saying, and Neil as well, because it, it's fascinating to work out, and it plays into this question about sort of. Uh, paying for digital content and monetizing digital content if we can find a way to crack basically like digitizing live and kind of a digi digi digital kind of market around live performances because actually there are big opportunities but also big risks to it i've just seen martin smith on the comment on the on the chat sort of saying digital theater costs 100 grand plus each one to make i mean at the moment as you say it's prohibitively expensive mm. and it's very hard to get right but if you get to a situation where you can essentially crack it you can find a way to monetize it for all organizations there's huge opportunities there particularly if the if the uk is sort of this like lead in the creative industries can be doing it first i think the, the first industry and particularly the first kind of like sectors that can be finding a way to crack it there can be huge opportunities for like we've seen what's happened with, with streaming of things like Streaming, streaming of music, which kind of 15 years ago seemed like one of these things that was just sort of like really going against the trend. And now it's one of the dominant forms of how people consume their culture. Yeah. But actually, it's, it's key that actually, again, COVID may just have been a flash in the pan and we're all going to, after we're all going to go back to saying we really like like the way, the way we consume content before and it hasn't really changed things. Um, I think that's a bit simplistic and naive to assume that, but we don't really know. It's yet to be seen. But we need to be quite aware that there are a lot, it's not just us that are trying to do this. There's lots of other countries that are looking at trying to do the same sorts of things. And we should be quite aware of the fact that if we just sort of like give up on this idea and say, actually, you know, it hasn't really worked for us, let's just leave it. In five, ten years' time, I don't want to find us in a situation where there's this huge new market existing in terms of consuming digital culture that we were never really a key player in, and we find ourselves at a competitive disadvantage in because you find yourself at the moment. If I want to go, if I want to go and listen to an orchestra, I've got kind of like five major world class orchestras in in London where I live that I can go and listen to, and I've got a choice of five. Actually, in five or ten years' time, if there's a shift towards consuming this sort of stuff digitally from your own home, um, I'm going to have a choice of 100. I'm going to have a choice of 150 across the world. And actually, if those five in London aren't doing everything they can to sort of make sure they are um, looking, at, looking at how they can be sort of playing this sort of game, playing this marketplace, we could find ourselves actually completely left, completely left behind. I mean, I... The Berlin Field do it brilliantly. Um, the Met Opera in, in New York has done kind of really, really good things in trying to how to look at new ways of consuming culture. And I don't, I mean, I don't want to sound too like cult, culturally or creatively nationalistic about it, but I think it's really important for the UK to be looking at where this sort of stuff is going to be going and making sure we're investing and, and kind of exploring new streams of new streams of consuming content because there's a danger that if we don't, we're just going to be left behind that we're going to be ruining the fact that we didn't um, in five, ten years' time. So uh, Tarek and Neil have both been very optimistic and positive uh, with Crystal Ball. My one was a little bit more a little bit more pessimistic, but um, we'll see. Like, it should be an, a really exciting time for the creative industries as a whole. Um, a conversation we should have had as a country this time last year but didn't because there's all sorts of things going on should have been new decade 2020s where is it that the uk is going to be really succeeded we had that conversation 10 years ago and we basically decided the country tech was where we we're going to be really kind of focusing we did a whole load of really good interesting stuff and the uk for the first five years of the last market at least actually became sort of a world leader in tech it feels like that's maybe fallen further away from a little bit with everything that's going on in the last few years actually there's an opportunity now for us to say look new decade um post-covid 
post Brexit, what do we want as a country to be focusing on our success? What do we want to be doing and say as a country internationally? And there's a really strong argument for that in the creative industries. And I hope that in five years' time we can sort of be we can sort of be looking back and thinking actually this decade was when the UK really sort of like came into its own as a global leader in the creative industries and of course particularly the music industry, but of course the creating cultural industries as a whole, it feels like there's so many opportunities for. I just hope we can we can seize those opportunities. I love that ambition um, and turning your um, your kind of challenge, I guess, into into a positive. We can now that we can see this kind of, I guess, threat and opportunity coming. Let's make the most of the opportunity and make sure it's not a kind of threat where we're lagging behind the market um, in a few years time. As, as, as you say, we can learn a lot from kind of um, from our own history on that. And um, we've only got a couple of minutes. Um, and Neil, I was just going to bring you in on a couple of the questions that Sam has posted in in the chat, just thinking about how our kind of, I guess, wider screen industries can work more with those who um, currently produce and um, and deliver live performances and whether there's any opportunity there. No, I, I'm absolutely, I'm sure that Netflix are investigating uh, producing live performances. You've already had Hamilton on, on Disney Plus and they're experimenting with different models to try and differentiate themselves. So in France, they've actually got a linear panel which sits alongside the, 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 their streaming channel, which actually they program 24 hours of, of, of their shows. But um, and Amazon have reached into, you know, showing sport live. So if they think that there's a market there, then they will definitely experiment. And then they will very quickly find out if indeed there is a, a market. And that's the one thing which I think we're at a disadvantage of. Is, uh, we lack the data and we lack the insight that can come from the data that those big streaming platforms have. I mean, we, we, we're sitting here working out how people's uh, viewing habits have changed based on surveys and interviews that we've undertaken at the BFI, that they have that information on dashboards every single minute of the day. So I think that's something we need to get more in, in, intelligent around and engage with is how can we replicate that type of data both for the UK and also internationally? Because I think you know we are known as a creative nation. We have one of the strongest brands in terms of creativity and there's a longevity to it, which actually, Ha allow, will allow us to, to potentially build on this you know, re renowned you know, uh, ability to tell stories, uh, uh, to create music, to, to program software which informs bits of plastic called PS5s. Uh, but only, I think, if we are, have the right data to be able to understand where we should be focusing our attention. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Neil. And we are just about out of time. But thank you so much again to our um, panellists and to everyone who's joined us in the room this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the conference.